to share, you know, to share that information because we can't move forward unless we know what happened, how is it impacting us, how is it impacting our communities, because uh, again, that trauma is in the DNA. That trauma is, um, is impacting us, and so the awareness of it allows us to transcend it, to know what's coming up when we feel certain things in our body, um, and so that's why, you know, we are here, just to seek that knowledge of self and um, I would like to begin with a, a libation. I think I'm going to flow from spirit this time. Let me just put some self-centering oil on. This This one is not as heavy as um, as last, I think it was Tuesday, as Tuesday session. Um, I'm just using a self-centering oil. The ingredients are a secret. I buy it from um, or purchase it from um, Tawi Network. Dot com, I think it's dot com, Tali Network, um, through the Osera Set Society, and it's just a mixture of herbs that calm the, the vibrations, calm the herbs, calm the energies, and um, support you focused on the task at hand. So I'm going to turn off Miss Lauren Hill. Okay. All right, family, so we'll just sit, we'll begin again by just giving praise and honor to the ancestors through libation. Okay? Omi tutu, omi tutu, omi tutu, tutu ari, tutu emi, tutu aye, tutu laroye. We give praise and honor to our ancestors who sacrificed uh, their energy, their life to, to surviving. Surviving within itself is a form of resistance. So we give praise and honor to our ancestors who survived and uh, we are the product of those ancestors. So we give praise and honors to you for, for your resiliency, for your, oh my goodness, for your unimaginable resiliency. Um, we give thanks to you for that. We give praise and honor to the ancestors who burned down plantations and sheds and poisoned animals and did whatever they needed to do. We'll talk more about that, but we give praise and honor to the full experience of our ancestors, Ma'afu. We give praise and honors to the ancestors who experienced that. Um, we send love, we send healing, we send elevation. We send love, we send healing, and we send, we send elevation. We affirm that, that you are proud of the work that we are doing. We are still shifting culture. We are still supporting folks um, cultivate that knowledge of self and expand their mind and uh, reinvest into themselves and into the community but we just we love you we give praise and honor and we just did not want to begin this space without just acknowledging the sacrifice and the resiliency um, that that you that you had to endure to to survive something so traumatic so we give thanks we give thanks ashe 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 yo ashe to the ships ashe to the ancestors all right, beautiful family. So I hope you have some water, just in case, you know, remember we drink water if we're feeling overwhelmed. Um, thank you, sister. Thank you for the heart eyes. So African resistance, it looked like many different things. So um, again, we'll just flow through the book. I have my highlighted notes. So it was persistent, it was unwavering, and it was multifaceted. Those who were in the field they're, they are categorized or um, I would say, yeah, the media and just even some people jokingly will say that they were um, that they were ignorant, that they were not intelligent. Um, yes, the massa like that type of energy. But what's not understood is that that type of um, response to the trauma was actually a form of resistance. What they were doing was stroking the ego, you know, of the overseer and of the slave masters so that they could have a lighter experience, so that, um, you know, they submitted, they chose to submit so that they could, um, so that they could survive, you know? Um, so that, so, so that if there were mistakes, instead of being beaten or whipped or um, receiving punishment, they would blame those mistakes or not really mistakes, but they would blame whatever the incident that was being um, presented on, 
on um, lack of intelligence. And so there's a quote that many of us might have heard. Maybe it's the first time you've heard it, but it's um, got one mind for my boss to see. Got one mind that I know is me. Got one mind for my boss to see. Got one mind that I know is me. And that's still something that a lot of us have to um, have to do. You know, if you work in corporate America, or if you just work for for anyone in general, you know what I'm saying. As an African centered therapist, I for sure be up in them sessions, calling down spirit, doing um, you know just energy healing and breath work and mantra work and all these things that are not in alignment with European psychology. But when I type my notes, I use their language. Again, got one mind for the boss to see, got one mind that I know is me. And so that's in the DNA. We are always finding ways to persist, to, you know, to heal and to protect ourselves. And so, um, yeah, so let's see. Let me see. What, what are we going with? What are we doing here? So, yeah, so that was a, a form of defense. That was a form of resistance. That that character, caricature that we often see um, in skits that are sometimes very tasteless about um slaves um field slaves being being ignorant um it was it was a form of resistance so so we'll start there um and then also another form of resistance was the house slaves that would be stroking the ego of the slave master or whomever was um you know the the I don't know the madam I don't know whatever just you know just basically playing the game you know and becoming close to these uh these slave owners the overseer these people in positions of power so that they can get what they needed so that they can protect themselves protect their children protect each other you know what I'm saying so everything was always was always tactical and strategic when it came to to that form of of resistance um of using intelligence or lack thereof as a form of resistance um and so let's see and so you know not every not all again obviously for some ancestors who were not born into slave into enslavement those were the the slaves that the or the enslaved ancestors that the white folks really were worried about because they knew freedom they knew freedom you know what i'm saying and they were tapped in to another life so it's not like they they were not born into this experience of pain and hardship and so um so yeah so when they when they would come there there were several revolts that we didn't hear um there's a book it's called american negro american negro slave revolts it was written in 1963 and this book documents at least 250 slave revolts throughout the history of enslavement in america and so there's obviously there's many many more that that might have gone undetected by um by Europeans or maybe they did not want to even um discuss that or 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 speak or put that out into the universe because um they did not want it to become a a thing or to to become a trend. So a lot of times these re, these resistance and these revolts were they were not talked about. They were not discussed because it would inspire other folks to to do so. And so let's see what else. So arson, um, arson was a very very popular way to to resist. So burning down anything you can think of, burning down homes, and I mean they would burn down the homes to the it was nothing left, nothing left, nothing left but the grass, but the dirt that the house was on. Okay, so um, arson was so popular as a form of resistance by African slaves that insurance companies did not offer policies to um, to slave owners or to, um, what is it called, to slaveholding areas. So um, that's, how, that's how intense those fires were. Um, so arson was a form of, of resistance as well. Um, and, you know, also suicide. You know, we've seen this um, depicted in different books and in different movies um like beloved i think it was beloved yeah yeah when she had she was tapped into it to an ancestor but yeah so sometimes um an individual suicide or a mass suicide was done as an act of resistance sometimes ancestors or enslaved africans would um would pretend to be sick so that they didn't have to work because they were tired um that was also a form of resistance as well
And so another form of resistance is music, song, dance. So singing and dancing. And we know that because that lives through us. We, we are rhythmic people intrinsically. Inherently, African people are rhythmic. We naturally connect to music. Most of us, most of us, you know, are naturally on beat. You know what I'm saying? Like we just... You know, we just on beat, we just flow with it, you know, and like European people, they just, they're just not. So like we're clapping and they're like on that mid part, you know what I'm saying? Like they just not. Okay. So anyway, just bringing it back to us. Um, so song and dance was, was very, very popular. Our, you know, enslaved Africans would sing um, throughout the evening. They would party all night. Um, and this was the way that they would honor themselves as being more than just a workhorse, more than just someone who is just working, you know, just, um, yeah, being a, a mule, so to speak. And so that was one of the ways that they were able to tap into joy, to tap into bliss, to tap into the goodness of life, the sweetness of night of life through song and dance. Um, and so, yeah, so um, music was also a means of spiritual renewal as well and that's something but we know that though we know that they sang songs peace sister peace we know that there were songs being sang um we know that there were dances you know i will i would hope that we know if not we're learning today i'm trying to think of a song that i can sing that might have been i don't know oh um follow the drinking gourd was one was a song that was created to to um support to support enslaved Africans who are wanting to to escape and to go north. There's a song, um, yeah, Follow the Drinking Gourd. And there's a book called Follow the Drinking Gourd. And I'll never forget this. I read this book in the second grade and I never forgot the song since the second grade. And I haven't read it since that time. Um, but I just never forgot it. And the song goes don't laugh at my singing. This is just for sharing, learning purposes. Um, but it goes, follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd. For the old man is waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. There's more to it, but that's all I can remember right now. But um, I think, yeah, the the drinking gourd, I'm like, I haven't checked in a, in a while, but I'm pretty sure that's the Big Dipper. And so, um, yeah, we, we use songs. Um, just, we just, we did anything we could, you know, to survive. And so let's see. Um, and also we use song to communicate vital information. Like I just said, um, sharing different roadmaps to survive, um, and song, our ancestors were able to reveal their truth, reveal their feelings, their desires, their aspirations. Um, what else? They also, they, they had very strategic assassin, assassinations planned, um, they would poison the ans the um the slave owners the overseers they were very very highly knowledgeable of herb of herbology even in an entirely new continent they used their ancestral wisdom to to be able to speak to plants they used their ability to just tap into nature to um to to talk to the plants and ask them how much do i need of you to kill this person how much do I need of you to knock this person out so that we can leave during the nighttime? So, um, yeah, poison was, was definitely um, one of the ways that Africans resisted in addition to using different herbs. And then, of course, escaping was, um, was a form of resistance. So we fought. We fought at every bend, at every curve. We never stopped resisting, you know. Um, even on the slave ships, they were always... There were always some sort of act of resistance. Come on now. It was just, no. Like, no one just walked up on that boat, okay? I don't know who, I think some um, learning company in Texas might have wrote or did write that um, enslaved Africans were, um, were migrated workers. Bullshit. Okay? And so next we will discuss um, how, you know... The colonizers or the European folks or white folks, how they um, resisted 
our resistance. So basically the methods of control against African resistance. That's the topic that we will be discussing next. So just as a quick review, African resistance looked like, um, looked like playing dumb. It looked like being docile and submissive. But remember, got one mind for the boss to see, got one mind that I know is me. We do what we got to do. We get pulled over by an officer. How you doing, officer? Oh, I'm so sorry, officer. We are constantly trying to survive. That that has never left us. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I'll be right back. Hold on one second. I have some cinnamon on the stove and I need to turn it off. I smell it. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Thank you for waiting. All the water um, boiled out of the pan, and I was smelling the cinnamon. So yeah, so um, so we'll just we're just at this time we're just reviewing the different ways um, our ancestors or enslaved Africans resisted enslavement. So playing docile or submissive, fires, arson, burning everything the fuck down, burning everything down. Okay, um, sometimes suicide. Um, using music and song and spirituality as a means of survival was also a form of resistance. Assassinations was a form of resistance. Poison was a form of resistance. Knowledge of herbology and using that to control their energy and their ability to function. Um, you know, we we cook their food, we wash their clothes, we you know every you know what I'm trying to say. So we we have we had honestly full control over their lives, and so some ancestors were unafraid. We're unafraid, we're unafraid to resist. And they did whatever they could do to, to, lower, to lower the defenses of them, to, to weaken their control and their power so that they could have the upper hand and, um, and, and survive and escape or, or um, steal a weapon. You know, stealing weapons were very, very um, popular. Um, when, when they escaped, of course, they would steal guns, knives, food, provisions, everything. You know, whatever they needed, they would take with them, um, which would leave, you know, the slaveholders with either nothing or very little to then go after them. So, um, so, so we will transition now to how the, um, the slaveholders were, um, were then trying to uh, minimize that resistance. So whipping, whipping um that's one thing that they, they didn't leave out um the history books or that um is very commonly depicted when we discuss um slavery or enslavement either in books or television so whipping was a form of, of doing so hanging was a form of of creating fear cultivating fear in the ancestors and then um you know also religion we talked about spirituality being a form of resistance right but spirituality or religion was also a means of mind control because what they did was they twisted the words or they used Christianity. I'll just put it plain. They used Christianity to tell the enslaved um, Africans that this is God's will, that this is your position. Um, they will find verses. I have, don't have that committed to memory, but they will find verses in the Bible to justify the treatment that they were enduring. And so... Africans would would cling or some Africans especially those who were not born in Africa but born American born or plantation born Africans would then cling to this spiritual system religious system of Christianity because of their belief and faith and hope in the afterlife so that's why black you know what I'm saying? We, we're not talking about that today but we will talk about that in the future but 100 percent the conversion of africans to christianity was for mind control was to make them believe that this is what god wanted you to do can you imagine being told that your god wanted you to be an to be a slave to work 15 to 18 hours a day and have nothing that, and that's what you believe. That's what you believe God planned for you. Can you imagine what that did to your psyche? Whew! Can you imagine? They knew what they were doing. The, the, the slaveholders, European, like they knew what they were doing. Every single step was calculated. It was all calculated. And so, you know, um, what another form of, of resistance 
of European resistance to African resistance was um, was raping African women. And then by doing so, they then created mulatto. So, I mean, I don't like that term, but that's just, you know, that's what they were called, mulatto. It's a Portuguese term derived from the, 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 the word mule. Um, and so they they basically created um co colorism they created they know divide and conquer or well, let's create an, a whole nother um you know let's let's create more black folks or we'll have light lighter skin you know black folks on or african people on this on this in this space we'll treat them better um we'll make them think that they are better you know and then we will divide them and then there will be mistrust amongst this group of people because if they trust each other, if they're united, if they're together, they might overflow, they might overthrow the system that we have then created. And so, yeah, so the raping of, you know, of African women by the European slave owners and overseers and just other whites in general literally gave birth to this to the psychology of skin color, you know, the hair texture, the facial features, that superior and inferiority feeling among African American of, of among Africans here um, or Africans who were then enslaved. And so, yeah, it created disloyalty, cultural mistrust. Um, yeah, very intentional. It was all intentional. Besides them also just being obsessed with black women in their bodies. Um, yeah, very intentional. So let's see. Um, so in the 1700s, there was a law that was passed um, that required slaveholders to provide better food and clothing for slaves. And that also limited their workday um, to 14 to 15 hours a day. And so this was done in an effort to reduce the African, to reduce rebellion. So it was so prevalent that a law was passed. So don't let nobody tell you that it wasn't prevalent. Okay, so next we'll discuss um, just four, three to four relative ways that um, African, enslaved Africans typically were, were thinking, what they were thinking like, or um, the, the foundation for their system of the, of, of resistance rather so the first thing is native born africans um they had a memory of their native land and they they were they they knew their native life and so there was this obvious or there was just this drive to be free you know what i'm saying because they lived that and so there was there was obviously a resistance to these disgusting atrocious conditions so that's one and then the second one is first and second generation african born or plantation born africans they maintain those memories that were shared with them by their grandparents who were the native born africans and so it was through those memories that inspired them to want to resist right and then three american born and plantation born africans who had no knowledge of anything virtually African or essentially African so all they knew was plantation life that enough that that alone that alone was enough for them to want to to be free or to resist in in their own way and then the fourth one is American born Africans similar to the third one became divinely inspired innately so something literally inside them inspired them to resist it was just this intuitive feeling of this is not my, this is not the way. This is not my odds. This is not the life that, that God chose for me. This, this can't be life. This can't be it. So that's the four, the four, um, like just four foundational, uh, mindsets for, for resistance. Uh, so let's see. So as many as 2000 enslaved Africans, uh, escaped every single year, every single year. Sometimes they were able to create these independent communities um, in spaces that they had a geographic advantage. So like really dense forests um, or swampy areas. Um, yeah, just just literally just tapping into that that survival thrust, like that innate desire to survive, um, uh, uniting um, and just using their own strategies to to resist so you know folks will come to reclaim and they would fight and they would win and they would have these communities of of free you know free africans um 
I remember when I was in, I was in Brazil when I was studying, I still study plant medicine, but at the time I was on a trip studying plant medicine and we did a night tour of the, of the, um, of the river. So it was completely pitch back, pitch black. All you hear is animals. Very, very Brazil. It was the, like the the essence, like the feeling of it was so similar to like that deep swampy backwoods, like just Georgia, South Carolina. Just I don't know, but I was I felt triggered. I felt like I was like I feel like I'm escaping to freedom. Like it did not feel comfortable for me. I don't know if I was tapping into like some sort of ancestral memory, but um but that was very uncomfortable for me and I had to I might close my window. Let me know if that's the people out there talking is too loud. Everyone's um growing food. So they're in their backyard um um gardening right now. But um but yeah, I just remember feeling like this is this is terrifying and this must have been what my ancestors experienced when they were escaping when they were you know fighting for their lives and running for their lives and i just remember i just called in peace because i reminded myself of what what was true and what was true is that i was there in that space i'm gonna close it the brother is loud sheesh my brother I can't even hear myself think. Shoot. So, um, I'm back. <laughs> so, yes, I had to call in peace during that trip in Brazil just to just remind myself, like, okay, what's true is that you are, you are not, you know, that you good, you safe, you're here by choice. Um, and just to take in the fullness of that, that experience. So, um, so yes, yeah, so they, they resisted, they were tactical, they, they formed armies, um, militia, weapons, making making their own weapons. So, um, so that was that was one of the ways that they resisted as well. So next, we'll discuss the um, the Haitian Revolution, and then um, we'll be done shortly. This one wasn't as long. And by the way, th today's group study uh, or study group is really just an introduction to resistance. This this don't even really scratch the surface, you know? So this is just to inspire you to, um, just to spark your light, to inspire you to be begin your own um, studying of this information, um, should you feel led to. But this is not a complete uh, uh, analysis of African resistance to enslavement or to the Ma'afa. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so yes. So the Haitian Revolution was strategic it was spiritual it was political it was it was it was everything okay like it was just they it was just oh my goodness so jean jacques uh i always say his his last name wrong jean jacques dessaline dessaline haitian people be nice to me be kind my french speaking brothers and sisters um so yeah so this was a 14 year revolution 14 years this 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 war lasted against the french against the british against the spanish um and so yeah even though it happened in haiti it fundamentally inspired um a revolutions across you know the entire african diaspora you know because it was talked about it was heard about these africans overthrew three countries you know what i'm saying and 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 reclaimed their independence um so yes yeah, so that um that was very significant to the African resistance movement. And so, yes, they overthrew, they overthrew a full-fledged system of enslavement and brought, and they were the first and only totally successful African slave, slave revolt in the Western Hemisphere. And so, again, as I said um, before, it inspired many people. And it scared and it scared European people. It it brought about their their dreaded fear. That it was nightmarish for them to to see African people fighting back. That was the last thing that they wanted. Peace, 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 brother, peace. So um, let's see. Okay, and so again, so the entire system of European enslavement was designed to literally break the will of Africans to exist. 
It was designed to break the will of Africans to resist. And that is why we began today's study group with a libation that just gave praise and honor and thanks to to all to all Africans who endured enslavement. You know what I'm saying? Because especially, I mean, praise and honor to those who committed suicide. You know, I'm sending them love and healing. But to those who survived, to those who persisted, you literally lived in opposition of what your destiny at that time was designed to do. The, that, des, that, that destiny, or the, no one's destiny was to be enslaved. Let me clarify that. We talked about this on Tuesday. Um, this was not God's plan. God's plan was not to have African people, you know, be enslaved and to be subjected to this. But a part of our expression as human beings having spiritual experiences is willpower um, and choice. And white folks made the choice to do those atrocious things. And unfortunately, it impacted us in such a negative way. Um, I'm still processing that as well. I'm still sitting with my spirit on what that meant um, spiritually. Uh, but but I don't personally, I do not blame God for that. And so let's see, is there anything else that I wanted to share with everyone? Um a lot of what's left in, in this chapter we discussed on Tuesday. Uh, so just a reminder that this information is important to understand so that you know what is happening within your own body, what is happening within your own communities. How did the Ma'afa psychologically impact African people living in different spaces in the world? What did that experience do to the psyche? And what do we need to do to facilitate that healing? You know, um, that's my stomach. I'm sorry if you heard that. So that's it, my beautiful family. Just again, in closing for this chapter, we fought back. 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 I'll just review the, the ways that Africans resisted. They resisted through arson, they resisted through music, through song, through assassinations, through poison, through escape, you know. Um, they resisted through surviving, right? They, they resisted through surviving and through storytelling and sharing their stories. Um, and so our history does not begin with trauma. It does not begin with enslavement. All of us have a beginning that began prior to the Ma'afa, prior to the enslavement of our ancestors. I think that um, identity is such an interesting topic for for people, for, for Black people um, who are not continental African or did not grow up in the Caribbean. So for me, my personal journey into my spirituality actually began with an identity crisis, so to speak. So you know, just studying my first degree, first degree is in Africana studies as in history, Africana studies. And so it was in studying that work while at the same time, you know, black communities or the black community was birthing the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I was literally coming into all of this information, right? Learning about what happened to our ancestors while at the same time, Trayvon Martin was murdered. Michael Brown was murdered. Eric Garner was murdered. So on the backdrop of massive murders in black communities of mothers, of children, of fathers, while also learning this work, it was I was just really, really confused about who I was. And I just felt like it was just trauma. I felt like it was trauma in the textbooks, trauma in my physical life. It was just so much trauma and I it just it really impacted me. And so, you know, I became an activist. I was working with the Dream Defenders for a while. Shout out to Phil and, and Parget and to everybody, you know. But yeah, you know, so I went into that space um, as an activist, just trying to um, undo that hurt that I was experiencing through um, through learning um, this, this information and just processing all of the, the trauma and the death that was happening. Um, through police brutality and white supremacy domination. And so um, it just, it didn't last long. Like I was just always angry. I was on the front lines, you know. I, li I remember one day I, om I, wanted, I almost punched a woman cop in New York City in the face. 
um, we shut down, we shut down um, Lincoln Tunnel. And I was getting angry. I, I believe an ancestor was coming through. And another ancestor with a cool head came through my sister friend and tapped me on the shoulder and said, we have to leave now. We have to leave now. We have to leave now. And I just looked at her and I just felt the energy just leave the body. Like that hot, hot, hot energy. It went down. You know what I'm saying? I was just so mad. And so I left New York and then I went to Tallahassee to go to FAMU to um to attend FAMU for my graduate program in which I received a, a master's of psychology in community psych. And that community psychology degree is African centered. And so the entire ethos of the program is literally learning how to support African liberation, how to support African people free their mind, tap into themselves, cultivate knowledge of self. It was it's an amazing program. I say it all the time. Literally walked into that program, Ashley Freeze, and walked out Omikunle Ekundayo. Walked in Christian, left practicing African spirituality, walked in eating meat and flesh and everything, left vegan, left plant based, left respecting nature, left understanding that I am that tree, I am the clouds, I am the sky, I am the rain, that we're all interconnected. It, it fundamentally changed my life that program and so again so I went down there you know joined the dream defenders dream defenders was founded at FAMU um and I still didn't feel peaceful I was like this ain't it you know this is not it and so it was through studying African spirituality that I found peace it was through studying African spirituality that I found peace that I that I you know developed that knowledge of self and um and I was able to see myself as God Cause if we were made in his image, then call us by our names. So you know what I'm saying? Like it just it changed my life. It changed everything. And so it was through studying black psychology and reprogramming my mind and, and reprogramming that miseducation that I was able to align myself with my divine self-image. Um and empower myself with information that they don't want us to have. Um, and so, you know, I'll share more about my journey another day, but I do have some notes that I wrote down that I wanted to share before we close. And so the first thing I have in my notes is peace is a form of resistance. I tweeted this the other day. Peace is a form of resistance. Why? Because once you live in a state of peace, you transcend fear. Fear, I'll tell you a story. So, um, I believe his name was Chapona. So, Olodumare, this is just a story from our tradition. Olodumare told Chapona, and this is just, again, a story, a Pataki, a story. So, Olodumare told Chapona to go to Earth and kill 100 people with smallpox. So, he comes to Earth. He meets Obatala. Obatala says, what are you doing here? What's your business? He says, Olodumare said to come kill 100 people with smallpox. He says, Okay. The man goes, um, Shapana goes into, you know, earth and um, comes back. And he's ready to go back to heaven. Obatala says, you're a liar. You're a liar. You said that you came to kill a hundred people, but you killed a thousand. Shapana said, no, no, no. I killed a hundred people. Nine hundred people died out of fear. So that is what's happening right now. All of what's happening with COVID, it is fear. Fear is literally killing people. And I'm not saying COVID, COVID is real. COVID is a real virus, engineered, manufactured, probably in fucking Quantico or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it's not real, but I'm saying that fear is what is killing people beyond just COVID. So the fear of, oh my God, I'm coughing because you probably have allergies. You're going to the hospital and then you're catching COVID or they're giving you COVID. I'm still trying to figure out how they're putting it out. You know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, no, 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 no. Fear 100% is, is one of the major ways that, that they are killing people be, besides stress. You know what I'm saying? So what is an opposition of peace, right? It's stress. So when we are not in the middle of a pandemic of, of either, cause think about it every two or three years, there's a, there's a hot word. It's terrorism. It's Ebola. It's anthrax. It's, um, um, I don't know, just. I don't, what is it? Just think about it. It's always something every few years. Why? Because they want to have the public in a constant state of stress because stress creates sickness in the body. And what? Who thrives? 
Big Pharma thrives. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and we are sick and we're ignorant and we, you know, are not, you know, it's just, oh, uh, it's just so crazy. One day we're just going to get into everything. So peace is a form of resistance because why? We transcend the fear that the media, that the government is perpetuating. Okay. So that's one. Intelligence. Intelligence is a form of resistance. Intelligence is a form of resistance. Intelligence is a form of resistance. The American IQ right now. We tick-tocking. We tick-tocking in the middle of a global pandemic. That's what we're doing. I'm not saying we can't be joyful. We be, be joyful, dance, sing, right? That's the African survival thrust. We dance, we sing, right? But are we also balanced? Are we also seeking knowledge of self? Are we doing meditations? Are we taking our herbs? What are we doing right now? Intelligence is fundamentally a form of resistance because you reprogram your mind, you reprogram your spirit, you reprogram the body. Right now, I'm literally regenerating my cells. I'm regenerating my cells right now. Full cell regeneration. COVID can't touch me. You understand what I'm saying? It can't. It cannot. And so this information is there. This is the age of Aquarius. This is the age of information. We got Google at our fingertips. We got audio books for free on YouTube that we can listen to. We have lectures from elevated ancestors available on YouTube. Knowledge of self. Do your research, brothers and sisters. Do your research and share it. Share the articles. Share the PDFs that you're finding. We need to, but this is how we survive. We survive through peace. We survive through the through intelligence. Because why? Because it's that it's that intelligence that empowers us. And it gives us that that feeling of protection. So spirituality for me, in my mind, spirituality is protection. Spirituality is protection. And I know you might say, well, you just talked all about in the ma'afa and enslavement. Well, where was the spirituality that was protecting them then? Right? All I know right now is my spirituality is protecting me. And I know that because I have direct experience with it. I live in the hood. I don't walk by armed robberies without getting touched. I don't walk that walk through police foot, you know, whatever foot patrol chases everything without getting touched. You know what I'm saying? Like I know through direct experience that I am blessed, that I am protected, that I am above this shit. I know it through my own through the cultivation of my vibration. It it just can't. And so there's a confidence. And there's a knowingness when you are grounded in your spirituality. And we know that. We know that. African people, we know God got us. You know what I'm saying? So there, so cultivate your spirituality. Take the herbs. Do the work. Do the rituals of protection. You know what I'm saying? So that's one thing. And I think we're done. And then the last thing. This is my last point because we're going to cut off soon. Um, Thank you, family. I, oh, I received the love. Thank you for affirming me. The last thing I want to talk about is the collective consciousness. This is the Soul Care Collective. This is a collective space for us to, you know, heal and learn together, right? So everything, as I talked about earlier, is interconnected. I'm connected to the ocean. I'm connected. We're connected to the birds. We're connected to the little ants that want to invade our houses in the spring. We all interconnected. I'm that ant. The ant is me. You know what I'm saying? So there is, we just were fundamentally interconnected. And so we talked about fear earlier. If you are adding fear to the collective consciousness, then you are adding, then you are actually decreasing the, the planetary vibration. So the best thing you can do, when I say peace is a form of resistance, I literally mean it. Because not only are you adding peace within your own physical ecosystem, but you're elevating the entire ecosystem of the planet by choosing peace. Oh, that's the best thing you can do right now. Peace is a form of resistance. Peace is activism. Peace is activism. Peace is activism. That is how we resist. Because what they're trying to do right now... Ashe, sister, Ashe. What they're trying to do right now is control our health. You know, all of this to me, in my mind, I'm still collecting research, still trying to understand it. But this is a ploy to control our health through vaccinations, through chips, through um, 
they've been trying to do it through food for years it's just all about money it's all about money and and controlling the health and so um um so let's see so yeah so we want to we want to make sure that our vibrations are high that we're eating high vibrational food that we're taking in high vibrational content so maybe maybe less shade room less love and hip-hop less drama less gossip more my art you know more lectures on on youtube more of this more african history study groups more knowledge of self so um i just yeah i just i'm not just it's not to say you can't be balanced you know what i'm saying i'm balanced y'all know me i have a good time i like to twerk i like to have fun but at the same time you know we have to be aware that we are at war we've never not been at war you know and so um this is how we arm ourselves we arm ourselves through peace we arm ourselves through intelligence and we arm ourselves through spiritual prote protection and that's also how we shift culture we shift culture through knowledge of self, and um, and that's it. I love you. I see you. I love you, and I see you. I love you, and I see you. And I just really affirm that you feel empowered through what we've talked about this week through African history and African Black psychology. Um, I hope that you feel empowered to continue your awakening, to liberate your mind, um, and to to affirm who you are in your entire existence and to align with your ancestral wisdom to align with with a god that looks like you you know what i'm saying um if it's black jesus is black jesus if it's allah it's allah if it's olo dumare it's olo dumare if it's the netter it's the netter we don't judge on this side in our tradition everybody ain't yoruba everybody can't practice ifa because not everyone is is geographically from with the space that we're from and we understand that there's other expressions of god based on language and location you know what i'm saying but we know that our system is connected to the akan tradition we know that christianity is literally written on the back of ifa of yoruba we know it's all the same thing but it's expressed differently so we don't we're not arrogant we're not so arrogant to say that our our way is the only way you know what i'm saying so it don't matter how you choose to protect yourself spiritually i'm just saying deep dive into it and live it okay and so i love you i think that's it oh yay i'm glad you feel i'm glad you feel the the empowerment queen. I'm glad you feel in alignment, sister. Yes, I say. And I receive it. Thank you for receiving me. Um, you know, I'm trying to step into my energy or this role that the ancestors want me to be in as someone who's sharing. If you know me, I'll be reserved. I'll be chilling. I talk like this with my friends, but I this is new for me. Like I'm not on here, you know, like like sharing information in this way. So I'm grateful for everyone who has showed up throughout the week to to, to receive what I've said. It means a lot to me. It empowers me. So this is reciprocity. This is an exchange because we're interconnected, right? I'm helping you and you're helping me. You're helping me live my divine pur purpose by receiving me. So, um, so I love you and that's it. I love you. We're going to end it there. Okay. Are there any questions? I forgot to ask that. <laughs> any questions? If not, I only got two hours of sleep last night, so I might take a little break before my 5.30 session. All right, family. So I will save this live. It'll be up for the next 24 hours. Um, I'm going to listen to it. I probably will just put it on YouTube because why not? Um, how can you study? How can we study more about the Ma'afa? um yeah i i think mean, there's books that i can share with you so definitely by um reading this for yourself the african african black psychology and the american context and african centered approach um i'm trying to think about some of my textbooks that i have they're over there i can't see their names um hmm because i want to give i want to be able to share let let me think about that and then what i will do is i will we will make a post either tomorrow or throughout the weekend that will have um book recommendations for learning more about either african psychology or the ma'afa but i'll tell you right now that there's these are the authors that you should look into naeem akbar francis cresswell singh 
Baba Kobe KK Kamban. Hmm. Oh, there's so many. I don't know why all these black psychologists are leaving my my consciousness right now. Moringa Marimba Ani. Um uh ooh. Wretched the Wretched of the Earth. I can't remember his Francis Fanon. Um there's just just Amos Wilson. Um uh Bob Wade Nobles, Bob Wright. There's so there's so many many um authors, um brilliant brilliant historians and black psychologists that I can share with you. So I will do that. We will create a post and we'll post it once a month because we want this information to continue to circulate. So I will create a post um with that information and we'll just keep sharing it. We'll keep sharing it maybe even twice a month. Um so that that information can be can be alive and well because we need we need this, you know, we need to be tapping back into that that ancestral wisdom. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that question, sister. That was a, a really, really good question.